name is Norma Hill. Um, I did my tag along. That's my girl. I'm a Vermont attorney. And um, please introduce myself to the panel that we're going to be closing. Uh, we're going to be talking about the happiness of the Virgin Concern. And to my left, I have Diane Silva, Kevin Law, and Kenny Wild. And I um, just want to congratulate Diana. She recently made a partner at Mango. So I just think that's Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was all Brian Frady's doing. <laughs> and um, Diana actually has taken the place of uh, Kate Campbell, who uh, came down to the club. Very much right here. Anyway, the, the issue we're going to talk about today, which are the habits of emerging concern, uh, there, there is a lot of regulatory uncertainty with respect to the habits of emerging concern. It's not quite the hot button issue as climate change may be uh, or as waters in the United States, but it, there's definitely a lot of confusion out there. There's a lot of state uh, states looking at these kind of emerging concerns, trying to figure out what do we do to regulate them. Uh, for the most part, it's considered to be PFAS, and I'm not even going to say the entire thing, I'm going to be Kevin do that. Um, but for the most part, that's what it includes. And there's the uh, EPA also looking at PFAS and other contaminants and emerging concerns that aren't currently regulated trying to figure out what to do about those contaminants. Uh, for those of you who may be new to environmental law, you may or may not know that contamination is regulated under uh, various statutes um, that Congress promulgated, uh, also under uh, some state statutes. So the contaminants that we're talking about most of which are not currently regulated in terms of cleanup. Now, the way I was introduced to PFAS and just in terms of emerging concern happened about three years ago. I was actually um, in a rental car. I just landed in Denver. Uh, I was on vacation. And I was driving along with my husband, and my cell phone rang. And it was the commissioner of the uh, Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. And she introduced herself and she said, hi, this is so-and-so off to the commissioner. I'm thinking, whoa, this is not good. <laughs> so, so I'm getting this phone call from the department, Vermont DEC commissioner. I was wondering what it was about. Well, it turned out that she was uh, asking me uh, to ask my client to have them provide water supplies to several people in a community that Vermont had determined were impacted by PFAS and could no longer drink their water, and that was being provided by groundwater. So it was a fairly significant issue, and it definitely got my attention. And then recently, in the practice that I'm involved in at my firm, we have a number of sites where we have been cleaning up over the years. Uh, some of these sites have actually been cleaned out, uh, rather cleaned up under Superfund and closed out. And we have recently received correspondence from both states and EPA. Uh, the states include New York and then also New Jersey, but uh, and also EPA asking us, well, we, we know you've cleaned up to this level for these contaminants. However, we now want you to go back and to look at PFAS, and you may need to do more remediation. Uh, at this time, EPA has not, as they said, regulated PFAS. It's trying to figure out what to do. Congress is trying to figure out what to do. The states are all looking at it. Uh, it's a um, chemical that has been used in a lot of different products that we're all aware of. Uh, Firefighting substances used in um, uh, nonstick pans, uh, used in dental floss, uh, pizza boxes, all kinds of things uh, contain PFAS. Um, and I think it's about 4,000 chemicals might fall in that pound for anyone chemical company. So what we were going to do today was talk about um, what's going on with the states, what's going on with the federal government, and just generally what's happening with litigation. But before we get into that, Kevin was going to provide some background on contempt and emerging concerns so you can understand what they are. I'm going to try. Um, my background is in environmental engineering and uh, risk assessment. So um, I actually first started out as a consultant. I'm going to turn this off. Uh, when I first started out as a, as a consultant rat undergraduate, uh, one of the first projects I got to work on was a project involving a, a PFOA matter in West Virginia. 
and um, it was my first introduction to these <coughs> specific type of chemical. Um, they are arguably potentially a family of about 4,000 plus compounds. I guarantee you if I took blood samples from everyone in this room, I would probably find them in, in, your, in your blood. So uh, one of the things that's really sort of concerning about that is that we, we all, to a certain extent, have a stake in these, in these compounds and what they might mean. So I, I was working on this, on this site in West Virginia. This was 2000, 2001 time frame. Uh, PFOA, uh, perfluorooctanoic acid is what that stands for. It was a, was a chemical that was used in the manufacturing of Teflon, and which I'm sure many of you obviously familiar with Teflon. Actually, before I, how many of you are familiar with these compounds, or at least heard of them? Just show of hands. Okay, cool. That helps. Um, so, and obviously, most of us are probably from this area. There are, there are um, some significant issues in various communities near, nearby related to the presence and the release of these chemicals from firefighting foams. These, these chemicals are used to, uh, man, in the manufacturing of these foams because they're incredibly good at putting out hydrocarbon fires. So good in particular that the, uh, the military actually has a military spe specification, a mil spec, that requires these foams to include these fluorinated compounds. Um, and so places like the Willow Grove uh, Air Force Base and some our, uh, Naval Aviation Center and a couple other places where they have done fire training to find very large or very high levels of these chemicals in groundwater. They're incredibly persistent and they basically cannot be destroyed unless you're incinerating them at very high temperatures. Uh, they can be captured and, and contain things like carbon. Um, they're also extremely mobile. So they're miracle chemicals. They repel water. They repel grease, which is kind of a unique thing. That's not a normal thing. For, uh, chemicals are usually either uh, hydrophobic or hydrophilic, meaning they can either like water or they don't like water and they like grease. So these compounds are sort of miracles. They're used, uh, unfortunately, in everything. So if you're a skier, your ski wax has enormous levels of, of these chemicals in it. If you, if you floss your teeth, as, as Peg mentioned, uh, your floss has these compounds with these boxes that she mentioned. So a lot of the products that we use, we are actually being exposed to a certain extent to these chemicals. However, the biggest concern are people who either worked in facilities where these chemicals are present, or if you live in a community where the groundwater supply has been affected, and thus your potential drinking water supply has been affected. Those are the two probably most substantial uh, communities of, of, of people that are potentially affected by these compounds. They're scary because uh, particularly a certain uh, uh, group of these chemicals are extremely bioaccumulated. So um, for example, PFOA, if I end up being exposed to PFOA, it could take up to seven years for half of it to leave my body. So once, once it gets into our bodies, it's really difficult for our bodies to get rid of them. So they're extremely persistent. So there's incredible technical challenges and scientific challenges associated with managing these problems, in addition to the fact that they're everywhere and in everything. Most of us here hopefully are not living in, in communities where the water supply is potentially affected. We're probably mostly getting our exposure from our food. Um, I've given a number of talks over the years uh, where I've actually shown data from studies of people going to grocery stores, just picking up food products um, from grocery stores and um, analyzing the levels of PFOA in those, like in olive oil, for instance. And there are, you know, there are measurable levels of these compounds. So most of us are just getting our exposure from food. As Peg mentioned, there's, there's no uh, real regulation to this effect. There, um, you know, John had made the, the point this morning, which I thought was a really excellent point, which is the concept of states acting for individual jurisdictions, acting as laboratories. And that's really, I think, what has manifested itself here in the United States, and actually even internationally, where individual states are coming up with their own rules, their own uh, guidance on how to deal with this, with this problem. Health advisories, for instance, for, for groundwater, for drinking water, uh, are propping up across the, across the country. And that actually only adds to the confusion because Vermont, New Hampshire, New Jersey, uh, all are coming up with different values, even for the same uh, individual chemicals. So it creates a little bit of havoc. As a scientist, however, I tend to uh, appreciate 
the challenge that these states have that we don't have, but it's kind of really interesting to see how the science gets utilized in these different places to come up with potential solutions for managing it. So that, that idea of, of these jurisdictions acting as their own labs uh, is, is a really interesting, interesting concept. So the challenge is real. It's, it's something that in some ways we all have a stake in. My, my wife actually last night watched a documentary that's on Netflix uh, called the, I forget the name of it, it's like The, the Devil We Know, I think is the name of the documentary. Um, and it's, it's, so it's, it's definitely a, a, an element that we are uh, becoming more familiar with. And unfortunately, I think it's one of those things that um, it t t sort of has taken some tragedies, it's taken some significant events to manifest into, into some action. So we'll, we'll see, see where it goes. Before we ask any other questions, do you, do you know exactly what's happening with respect to New York in terms of reach or any other country internationally with respect to I don't. I know Australia is actually um, one of those countries that is taking a very aggressive approach to this. They're, they're investing a lot, particularly the, um, the Australian Environmental um, Agency, and again, I apologize for not knowing the formal name. And a lot of the universities in Australia um, have been doing a lot of work. Uh, and so they're, they're somewhat uh, a little bit of ahead of the game in terms of thinking about how to manage this. Not to say that they don't have the same sort of regulatory and policy challenges that we, we do here. I think a lot of it there was driven by uh, issues associated with the presence of these chemicals in the spotlight films. So Australia has sort of, and I think in a way, I'm detecting almost more, they're, they're attempting to get out ahead of the front, it almost as a way of um, not only dealing with the problem, but it's, just, it's definitely a source of pride for the individuals that I've uh, connected with in Australia. So now in terms of Europe, uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. I know the Netherlands, some of the Netherlands countries have taken uh, some steps, um, but beyond that, I'm not, I'm not familiar with. Uh, I, there are some states in the United States, for example, a Washington state passed the law, I think it was last year, uh, banning the presence of these chemicals in food packaging. So there are definitely things that are happening um, from, from a statute standpoint that, that I think uh, you, know, you, you might see more, more globally uh, getting to start to crop up in other, other places. But it's been pretty quiet this morning. I think there's a House bill, um, it's, it's literally like two seconds <coughs> long, uh, the PFAS action plan. Right, yeah, right. So there is some, there is some movement um, uh, with regards to it, but. Uh, Thanks, Kevin. So, Diana, we were going to turn it over to you, because you could sure. tell us what's going on with EPA uh, sure. in terms of what their thinking is, in terms of standards, regulations, and also maybe just talk about what I mentioned earlier on, which is with respect to cleanup, yeah. having uh, various uh, parties go back to sites where there's already a bit of mediation, and having those parties pursue mediation, or at least monitoring, right. to see if these chemicals are there. Right, so um, as, as we discussed, um, the PFA, PFOA, PFOS family of chemicals, and there's a number of chemicals that fall under that, sort of umbrella are not a regulated hazardous substance under any of the federal um, alphabet soup, CERCLA, HASCA, TASCA, none, none of them. And so what EPA has done, and when, um, when a new, when I put new in quotation marks because these chemicals have existed since the 60s, but when a new chemical comes to EPA's attention, the first step is they start to evaluate it scientifically. And so in 2016, after evaluating it for a number of years, they came out and published a human health advisory level. Um, a human health advisory level is even less than a guidance document. It's not actually an enforceable regulation. It's basically just saying there's a level that our scientific and epidemiological studies have shown potentially could create a human health risk. Um, but it's not you know, necessarily a full peer review. Many different scientists have, have opined on this, but it's a pretty concrete number. And so in 2016, they set the, uh, the health advisory level for um, PFAS at um, 70 parts per trillion um, as a lifetime exposure, with in terms of trillion, mo most cleanup levels are at parts per billion or parts per million. So this is 70 parts per trillion lifetime exposure. Um, so very, very low levels. And, and that's combined for PFOA and PFOS. And then as, as um, Peg mentioned and others mentioned, <coughs> other states have even adopted even more aggressive standards. So. Um, I know, Candy, you're going to talk about that, but for example, regionally, New Jersey is less than a third of that. So their level that they've set as a human health advisory level is 13 parts per trillion. Um, and in Pennsylvania, they've just adopted the federal health advisory level. Um, 
They have not, EPA's next step in that process is to set up a maximum contaminant level, which is the next step in you know, starting to get listed a chemical under the, under the regulatory construct, and they haven't yet set that. What they've done is to start setting up these advisory groups and these committees. So this past spring, so a year ago, May 2018, they held a leadership summit to bring a, a bunch of different um, sectors together to try to develop a work plan of what are we gonna do about these chemicals. And they were supposed to have a PFAS management plan by this past fall. Um, that hasn't been issued yet by the agency, but I think it'll hopefully happen within this you know, beginning of 2019. Part of that process is to develop what Peg mentioned as cleanup standards. So obviously there's exposure levels in just products, but at Superfund sites and even state level sites where they've adopted a federal standard, there's no cleanup level. So if you have a site like the Willow Grove Air Force Base or other places that have known um, use of these chemicals, and you want to, you're cleaning that site up for a variety of purposes. It could be petrochemical contamination, it could be TCE, it could be whatever. You also have, it, it hits in your screening levels for a PFOA or PFOS chemical. What, do you, what are your remediating um, consultants tell you? How clean is clean? How, how clean do you need to get it? No one knows. Um, do you get to the health advisory level? Do you go higher or lower than that? There's no standard for groundwater, which is usually the driver for a cleanup of this nature. Um, and that injects a lot of uncertainty. Uh, as Peg mentioned, if you have an old Superfund site that's closed, and I put clean in quotation marks, but clean, and going through your periodic five-year review program, does that a reopener? There's a chemical no one thought about 20 years ago when you clean, you know, clean up that Superfund site and now it's being reopened. Um, so that's definitely a concern. And with that, um, in terms of the pervasive use of these products throughout history, when EPA as part of that, um, that leadership summit and other analysis they performed on existing Superfund sites and they said, okay, how big of a problem could this be under a five year review and reopener provision? The statistics that they came um, up with is that there's 315 Department of Defense uh, sites that are sites like the Willow Grove Air Force Base that are cleanup sites that were firefighting training areas or other locations where foam or other materials were used. There's 535 FAA airports that also would have used these chemicals for firefighting ability um, that would be potentially targets of further cleanup. There's 286 landfills that are on the NPL, the National Priorities List, that have a documented use of this chemical or came up in a sampling. So those would also be sites that this cleanup, whatever the level is, target would be uh, made. And there's hundreds of sites associated with manufacturing facilities where a site has a cleanup obligation and thus far hasn't really had a cleanup obligation because these aren't a regulated chemical under CERCLA or any of the other state programs. I mean, I'm sorry, federal programs. And it's cross-cutting industry. It's not just the firefighting foam or the manufacturing facility who built these, you know, developed these chemicals, um, but it's electronic manufacturers who would have used it to coat materials, coating manufacturers for things like, um, like you said, the food products, oral bread and markers, and like literally your, your microwave popcorn bags have this stuff in it. So really just industries that necessarily aren't environmental type industries or chemical industries have used this product. Um, photography, mining, paints, inks, lubricants. So there's there's a lot of what? Metal plating. Metal plating, yeah. So there's there's a lot of sites that were not traditionally a super fun hit site where you're like, yep, that's an old chemical plant that everybody knows might be a super fun site. There's lots of sites that this chemical might put into that bucket and it expands the universe of cleanup obligations. Um, EPA has not really taken an official position on the reopener question of a five-year review. You know, whether uh, if you had a, a, um, a sampling level in your, in your file that hit on a PFAS chemical compound, if you even tested for that, because most people didn't, um, what, that, what does that do to a five-year review at a Superfund site? Does that open the door for more cleanup obligations? Um, there's a significant, I think, concern from the regulated community um, that that might be a reopener and a costly reopener. If they've cleaned up the site and it's just going through five-year review, there's not a lot of cost being spent at that stage of the game, and does this open the whole cleanup obligation up again? Um, so those are some really, real issues that I think both EPA is trying to figure out and the regulated community that have had these chemicals used at their site on what to do. Thank you, Diana. Sure. Katie, can you speak to what's happening with the states? Sure. Uh, the states have sort of taken a laboring war with regard to addressing PFAS contamination 
and um, the approaches vary across the state um, and across multiple regulatory programs. So you'll see some states who are really um, interested in uh, regulating product labeling or consumer product laws. Um, and you've got states uh, interested in chemical action, developing chemical action plans. And then um, on the cleanup side, designating certain substances as hazardous um, and setting standards for drinking water and groundwater. So um, each state is sort of taking their own approach and really um, some states are more involved than others in terms of how much uh, they want to research and evaluate the risks of these substances. So just to narrow down a little bit, um, in New Jersey, they, uh, the state of New Jersey has been very involved in researching these risks. Um, and recently, uh, January of this year, declared that PFNA is a hazardous substance. Uh, which means that PFNA is subject to a strict liability scheme of the Spill Act. Um, and uh, it, the state also requires that uh, when you're cleaning or investigating and cleaning, a, cleaning up a property <coughs> is now obligated to investigate for PFOS. Um, which, and that process is overseen by an LSRP. So the um, so in terms of doing an investigation, that's one thing that is going to have to be considered. Um, it, additionally, New Jersey set a groundwater quality standard for PFNA at 13 parts per trillion um, and has some, a maximum contaminant level that was adopted for PFNA at 13 parts per trillion. Um, and that was just adopted in September of 2018. They have uh, recommended standards for two other PFAS um, chemicals. Uh, for PFOA, it's 14 parts per trillion, and for PFAS, it's 13 parts per trillion. Um, and certainly, they're doing a lot in terms of trying to uh, investigate these risks and develop ways to, uh, to address PFAS contamination in the state. Um, turning to Pennsylvania, we've seen some recent up efforts by the state to um, start to investigate PFAS risks. Um, currently, they are, they have, the state has adopted the EPA's health advisory standard of 70 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFAS, um, and that is for either substance or in combination. Uh, but they are looking at this time to determine whether they need a more stringent standard. And in uh, September of 2018, Governor Wolf announced the establishment of a multi-agency PFAS action team, which will be um, it, multiple agencies within the state um, coming together to, de to develop a comprehensive response to identify sources of PFAS and ways to eliminate those throughout the Commonwealth. Um, additionally, as part of that, um, uh, as part of the executive order that Governor Wolf uh, signed, he directed the DEP to develop um, ways of sampling uh, for PFAS across public water systems in the state. Um, so I think certainly you're going to see more coming from Pennsylvania in, uh, in terms of particular re regulation. Um, New York uh, is another state uh, that has taken a strong lead on uh, developing uh, understandings of P PFAS risks. In 2016, they developed a water quality rapid response team, which has been um, deemed as a national model for researching, identifying, and addressing water contamination. Uh, and they do play a role with specifically for PFAS um, in identifying and addressing uh, that uh, contaminant in public and private waters. Um, they also regulate PFOA as a hazardous substance um, and have proposed a MCL for PFOA and PFAS at 10 parts per trillion, which would be the most protective MCL um, that has, it is the most protective MCL that has been proposed. 
and I'm sure Kevin can speak more to the science of this, but in terms of their reasoning for going to the 10 parts per trillion, they're considering uh, what is termed as body burden. So as Kevin just discussed, we all have uh, PFAS substances in us at this time. Um, and so to take into consideration the future exposures, um, they have evaluated what is the body burden, what is already inside of us now to even <coughs> further uh, create stringent standard for uh, people and PFAS. <coughs> Kevin, maybe you can just take a step back and tell us what, what's the science of date in terms of what the impact may be health wise yeah. in terms of these chemicals. I mean, what, why should we be concerned with our EPA states and then anybody who's drinking water that might be sure. contaminated? Yeah, so all of, I mean, actually, all, all the numbers that, uh, that Candy just walked us through, they all are based upon, and actually, probably the most substantial aspect to the differences between these, these different values is, is really what toxicology is being used in their derivation. There are some differences in the exposure assumptions that are used between these different agencies in coming up with these health advisory levels. And there's also differences in what's uh, commonly referred to as the relative source contribution, RSC. Um, when, this, when the fed, federal governments or when states establish things like MCLs, they are, uh, and I put this in quotes, they are health-based, right? They're based upon the results of animal studies um, where they, they would eventually take the information from these animal studies to come up with a tox toxicity value, which is essentially a number that relates exposure to hazard. And starting with that value and then making presumptions about how much people could consume, you know, how much water do we consume in, a, in, a, in, a, in our daily lives over a certain period of time, they then use risk assessment to come up with a level that we can consume, you know, you use the lifetime advisory, the concept is every day of our lives, anywhere in, in, in that particular state or in the country, and, and not be subject to an increased risk above what we might otherwise be exposed to in our, in our lives. Now, all of these values, all of them, are based on the results of animal studies. Toxicologists in different organizations, different uh, agencies will look at the library of outcomes in these toxicological studies. And what they're really seeing now, there, again, there are thousands of these chemicals. And really what we're talking about is there's like 12 to 20 that have really been the subject of rigorous assessment and testing. So even though there's a number of these compounds, we're really only beginning to see numbers being generated, tox values being generated that we can then use to think about what concentrations could people be exposed to that would be arguably de minimis risks. And different agencies are actually interpreting that library of animal data differently. Um, you know, National Academy of Sciences might refer to this as a science policy decision. So there is judgment that does go into the selection and the derivation of these values. One state might assume a relative source contribution or essentially our background burden of 50%. And so their number accounts for that. Another might presume 20%. So there's some aspects to that that exist as well. They also then might interpret these talk studies in such a way that they come up with and add different levels of uncertainty factors to them. So a lot of these talk studies come from, for example, in the case of PFOA and PFOS, they're based on particular outcomes. And um, I think in the case of, um, for example, PFOA, there's concerns about developmental effects um, that then get used, uh, kidney effects, you know, high cholesterol issues associated with potential exposure. So toxicologists will start there, and then they will add uncertainty factors to those values to account for things like, it was animal studies that I used to develop this tox value. But we're, we're interested in, um, there's gonna be some, some uncertainty in the fact that we're using it for evaluating human risk. So let's divide that number by a factor of three. And you know the, the library of information was you know, kind of uncertain, so there's some uncertainty there. Let's add another factor of 10 to that. And we want to be protective for sensitive subpopulations, like children and the elderly. So let's add another uh, uncertainty factor to the, the derivation of this, this toxin. So what happens is different agencies do start with the same library of information. They then make different decisions about how to go about deriving the tox, tox values that subsequently get used. In, in the, the numbers that, that you hear Candy kind of, kind of list there. And that 
diversity of, a, of judgment has resulted in this incredible um, shift um, towards you know, lower and lower numbers. It's almost a race. Uh, and, and there's definitely a degree of pride. I do a lot of work with folks from NJDEP, for instance, who are a, a, sort of a lead, lead, lead uh, in, in terms of pushing where we're going with these, with these compounds, as you can see, you know, with them establishing actual MCLs. And they're very proud of the fact that they're, they're ahead of this. But, and they are interpreting the studies in, with a different, a different light. Um, you hear organizations like the uh, ATSDR, the Agency, Agency for Toxic Substances and Abuse uh, Registry, that also came out with a big, uh, essentially, compendium. Uh, they call it the Toxicological Program. It was a source of, some of you may have been aware, there's a lot of um, consternation about, about that last, last year. And they, they were recommending uh, uh, tox values that were actually more stringent than USDP had originally used in developing their original health advisories. So there's movement happening. But in some ways, it's almost based on the same universe of tox information. Just different agencies and the toxicologists <coughs> and, the, and the, the scientists in those agencies are looking at the data a little bit differently and making different, um, you know, drawing different conclusions about what, what level to protect for. So, Diana, what, what are you seeing now in terms of the cases you may be handling, yeah. the client matters you have with, with this uncertainty? Yeah. Um, so yeah. Coming back to EPA. Yeah, I think there's an uncertainty in a couple levels. So again, these quote unquote closed Superfund sites, and, and what does that mean? Is it really closed? Um, if I'm starting to do an allocation for my site, and we know that there's a PFOS or PFOA, it's not a hazardous substance yet under CERCLA, and so there's no real obligation to clean it up. There's also no ability to get cost recovery against other PRPs because it's an element of your claim. You have to have a proven hazardous substance. Um, so what do you do? How do you allocate? amongst a group of people when some people you know, are saying that's not even really something we're obligated to clean up yet. Um, I think it's also, we haven't got into this, but under due diligence, under your standard you know, phase one and phase two, when you're buying a site that could be a potential brownfield, this is not something that people focus on in terms of a, a due diligence transaction. Now, I think people are starting to, especially in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, looking at sites and saying, is this a site that ever had a fire? You know, in the 50s, was there a normal fire to this facility? Did someone come and spray firefighting foam here? Something as simple as that could now be a trigger, as a due diligence trigger, that there may be a contaminant here at this site that normally would not have been a recognized environmental condition under a phase one or phase two report that now is. Um, you know, if you're taking the most conservative, I think a lot of developers would say don't go looking, but some people want to look. Um, um, other things that are just really technical constraints. So if you're going to go sample for these items at a site that you own, um, most, a lot of the sampling gear that scientists like yourself use have PFOA in them. Um, so personal protective equipment, um, beakers, things like that, have for the properties that you described, the stuff makes things slippery and make things not stick. And so those, in, in terms of scientific testing, are things that are built into those components. Um, you can't really use that if you're testing for these chemicals because then it's contaminating your, uh, your source. Um, <laughs> things with, you know, I think is a, a driver now in, in civil litigation and that's come up in some of the ones that have been very publicized in the Philadelphia Inquirer is medical monitoring. Um, we all, you know, maybe 30 years ago, medical monitoring was this new concept in tort law. I'm going to get a trust, a class action, and I'm going to get someone to pay for my periodic monitoring for a health condition that I don't yet have. Um, PFOS is, is now the new beryllium. It's the new asbestos, I think, in terms of a medical monitoring claim. There's a legitimate basis that a large-scale population has been exposed to a chemical that's not a declared <laughs> hazardous substance, but you have studies that say it is at a level. You've been exposed in a community way above background because you're drinking water um, at certain levels. But I don't have any actual um, physical manifestation of a disease yet, or I have a disease that it's just maybe because of my age. What does that mean? Um, and so the most recent decision on this topic was in the Third Circuit, which is this Giovanni case that was based in the Willow, Gray, Willow Grove Air Force Base um, and then other, the one in Delaware, I forget the name of that one. Um, and that was the question. It was whether really medical monitoring is appropriate and whether it was barred because that site's going through a circle of cleanup. And the Third Circuit reversed the district court and said it's not. It's a claim that's right and it's not interfering with the circle cleanup because there's a one section 113 H of circle not to get into a whole circle discussion basically bars a collateral attack on the cleanup 
as you can't bring an action to try to undo an otherwise approved cleanup program. But medical monitoring falls outside of that. It's clearly a cause of action that a group of citizens or a group of residents would have. Um, so I see in terms of projected litigation for sites that have had PFOA or PFOS at that, there is now scientific data that shows that human health <coughs> exposure at a certain level um, could cause potential problems. And that's exactly what a medical monitoring claim is supposed to provide for. And I think those claims will become more pervasive. You know, Willow Grove, the West Virginia Washington Works facility, all of those class actions were based on a medical monitoring cause of action. I think that's the new ground for a lot of these cases. Okay, let me ask you a hypothetical. I think part of it's hypothetical, part of it's not, is um, I'm actually working with my colleagues, Frank and Steve, right now on a site, Plantel, where EPA registry has come back and said to us, okay, we've got this you know, PSRA issue here, PFAS, whatever. Um, we want all the PRPs to go back out and say, so it's up. Like, you all to go back out and monitor for this. Yeah. So <laughs> they find it. Then what? Going then back to what you were yeah. just saying that, you know, it's not a hazardous substance, but they're going to want cleanup of some sort. They're going to want something done in terms of protecting the public. So how do you advise your client? I'm thinking, Kevin, from your perspective, if yeah. you're the consultant on this, sure. what are you telling your client? Because if it's in all these products, yeah. you could say, well, maybe uh, we own the landfill, so maybe you know we have some responsibility as the owner. But what about everything else that was thrown in that landfill? Pizza boxes, dental box, yeah. whatever. How do you advise your clients? Yeah, parsing out. For example, particularly with regards to landfills, because landfills are going, they are one of the major sources of these, of this, this, this family compounds, because everything that we've made has had this stuff. We send it to landfills, and then leachate ends up with very high, in some cases, very high levels of these, these compounds, which can subsequently result in groundwater problems, and so on and so forth. Um, so that the unwinding and figuring out where did it come from is, it can be very challenging. Um, I'm working on a project right now in Oklahoma City where that is a, that's sort of the key issue right now. We've got a, 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 essentially a client that has a problem, groundwater problem, but the, the, there is no evidence to suggest any reason why it would exist there. Now there is a, there is a military installation on the other side of the city um, that, but we haven't been able to connect the dots, right? So to actually draw, draw the line between those two, it's, Actually, scientifically possible that you could have a plume of that size, but again, that, that's sort of that's sort of pending, and, and we'll have to see. But I will. There's one thing I will say, um, and this is this is where sort of my risk assessment reaction to some of the things I heard. If if we have the tox information, and so agencies like NGEP, US EPA, have begun to start to land on that number that they believe can be used to quantify the dose response relationship, meaning I'm, I'm exposed to this and that triggers that response that I, I take so much Tylenol and then cool my fever goes down, okay? Because that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about a non-carcinogen, even though there is some potential for them to, to cause cancer, a non-carcinogen that's going to have a non-cancer effect, so it's a threshold effect. I've got, if I've got that tox value, I can evaluate exposure. I can, how much water does somebody drink or how much does the population drink? I can calculate that non-cancer risk. And things like the, you know, the National Contingency Plan and agencies like the EP have established risk management goals that would potentially trigger the need for risk management action. So I've gotten, even though the rec recognizing, and this is where it's, it's more of a legal thing, I suppose, as opposed to a scientific thing, I have the capability now to tell you if you have a potentially unacceptable risk that, that exceeds these risk management goals that might warrant some action. Um, but again, if it's, it, if it's legally impossible for me to pull these chemicals into my assessment and my analysis, um, you know, that's, that's a whole different, whole different ballgame. But I think the science has reached a point where we can, we can start to support decisions, decision making, um, if it's, you know, if it's you know, an obligation to, to do so in these, in these programs. Okay, so what would, what would be your litigation yeah. strategy? Yeah, so it, I guess it depends on how risk averse your client is and, and how long-term projected costs they want to deal with. Do they want to rip the bandaid off now? Do they want to find a mechanism? I mean, that's the other part we haven't talked about. Um, how you clean these things up is a huge unknown. It's not, it's not like a, um, you know, a, a, an oil spill where there's a vapor system and there's a very simple like method to do this. <laughs> 
the science about how to remediate these chemicals from groundwater and soil is still evolving. And so what cleanup, you know, your client's always going to ask you, how much, okay, if I clean this up, I know I'm not supposed to, how much extra is it going to cost me? I think the answer is, I don't know at this point. <laughs> is like, well, I don't know, what, what, do you, what methods it's, do you use? This is the new day of pump and treat. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we have gotten away from having to use pump and treat as a solution. Right. There's not much else for yeah. these compounds at this point. Right. Which is, a, it's games, it's horrible. It's, yeah. a, it's a horrible outcome because you're, you're now in a situation where you're, you may never be able to get a site to a point where it's, it doesn't require some kind of control like that. Like Right, and so in terms of that, that just drives the cost driver up. And if it's a long-term um, obligation for you know a pump and treat or a maintenance, your client's going to look at the cost for that over the next 50 years, maybe. Um, and what's the risk right now that someone's actually going to make me do this? Right now, under the federal system, if you're in a state that doesn't have their own state cleanup criteria, the risk that the federal government's going to make you do that is quite low right now. But in five years, it might be different. And so are you looking for a, a quick close out of the site and walk away, or are you looking, you're gonna be stuck at the site for at least 20 years, and so I'm gonna to have to do this eventually, be proactive versus reactive. Right. I, I think that is gonna be difficult based on, like you said, your client, what their funding stream is, what their you know appetite is for an aggressive cleanup or a not aggressive cleanup, because the site could have been a site that all the other chemical constituents was totally fine to have a long-term you know cap on the, on the site, an asphalt cap, and just, it's cheap. But then you add this into the mix, and the only real way to treat it currently is pump it all out of the ground, very costly. So, Sandy, thinking about New Jersey and thinking about NRD, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen in Jersey with respect to natural resource damages, with respect to these contaminants, or really any state that, that's going to actively pursue NRD? I think uh, you've seen that Jersey is taking a more aggressive enforcement approach for Certainly, um, I think PFAS is something that's going to be coming up, uh, particularly because it, PFNA is now regulated as a hazardous substance. Um, so, as a, you know, advising a client in in New Jersey, I would uh, definitely say that that's on the table in terms of a risk that they need to be aware of. Um, one thing <coughs> that uh, is sort of our bread and butter is insurance. So. We do uh, advise our clients to get pollution legal liability insurance, um, especially in a transactional um, deal, and that uh, insurance would cover in our in our state. So um, that's a way to mitigate that risk. Are the carriers excluding this right now in terms of any specified endorsement? Um, I think that really comes down to a particular fact pattern okay. as to whether they will or will not exclude. Um, P PFAS is covered in the standard PLL policy. Um, so in order for a carrier to exclude it, they have to manuscript an exclusion, which will um, specifically state that they're not going to be covering this substance. Um, just like any other substance that might be specific to that site as an issue that the carrier is or is not comfortable with based on that particular risk. Um, we've seen, we've been very successful <coughs> in obtaining uh, coverage for sites that have, uh, have stored and known use of PFAS substances like firefighting homes um, and, and pretty much anything. Um, the use of storage is, is a risk that the carriers are very comfortable taking. Um, but it does, when you um, have an issue, just going back to sort of risk assessment, in terms of a carrier's risk appetite, they really want to see the technical data to support whether there is a risk at the site or not. Um, and we t typically provide carriers with like phase one report and additional um, evidence to support whether there is a risk involved in the site. Um, certainly if you have exposures to receptors, that's going to turn the carrier off. <laughs> but um, in cases where we uh, did have exclusion for PFAS, there's a way to manuscript the exclusion that still is the benefit of your client. 
um, by either limiting the exclusion geographically or agreeing to pay higher self-insured retention um, okay. so that you can kind of get what you want and it, uh, but not everything. Yeah, some protection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I just realized what time it is, so I thought maybe I'd move it up just to see if anybody had any questions. They'd like to ask our panel. I have a, actually a scientific question. Um, my best. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Beyond I mean, this is a fascinating discussion of remediating and what's going to happen and liability and eventually litigation, but this, this is frightening um, if you're a human being. Yes. So is there any scientific um, support that maybe people ingesting charcoal or deactivated charcoal or clay? Uh, it's sort of, sort of the medical approach to, to treatment. I, I, I'm not familiar with, with what that what that would be. Um, I can tell you this. So this is this is me responding as uh, sort of an informed human, right? Who um, you know has recognized this is a, a very substantial uh, element that's present in all of our lives to a certain extent. But it's much much more so in people who live in communities where the drinking water is affected. And uh, in areas where you're work living near facilities or even working within facilities where these chemicals were used at really, really uh, substantial uh, amounts. So I think for most of us, the general population, if you will, unless we're drinking it, unless we were working in these facilities, I think we're okay. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm not going to, I'm not a toxicologist. <laughs> I don't want to say definitely nobody's going to be harmed by this. Uh, just you know, from your pizza box. I think that's true. I wouldn't necessarily, you know, want to be a fear monger or anything. But I can tell you that if you if you're in these communities, um, your body burden to use one of the things that can is much much higher. When I mean, we look at the blood levels of people who are in communities where the water supplies are affected, they are substantially higher than the blood levels of the general U.S. population. Um, what does that actually mean in terms of the health effects? Is still there's a lot of uncertainty there. I can tell you in, in some cases, even on, on cases, and again, this is getting into sort of case law stuff. I, I, so I'm not a little out, out, out so on my balance here, but I know there actually are toxic tort um, cases where what has happened, what the information has come out of the, as, as part of this, is that the, the, for example, in the case of worker exposures in facilities. That you, that there are co co confounding exposures to other chemicals while being exposed to something like the FOA that may actually be the reason why certain people got sick. So it's, it's really, it becomes really difficult to segregate um, the actual health effect in a particular individual. Now, I will say this. So the, you were talking about medical monitoring. So one of the big deficiencies is we, we're, a lot of times when it comes to epidemiological information, when looking at information with uh, studies in humans, they're, they're what they call um, cross-sectional studies. So they'll look at the population in a, in a plant and ask, okay, what are, the, what are the health effects that we're seeing and what's the health of the workers in this plant? Well, that's in a given moment, right? The alternative to cross-sectional assessment is a longitudinal assessment where you monitor the health of people over time um, and you can kind of evaluate their exposure versus the health effects. And that is a much that is a much better way of assessing actual exposure and what, what the actual health effects are from, from that exposure. And unfortunately, that is just a, that is a, that is a there's a massive lack of information regarding that sort of longitudinal uh, assessment. And again, that kind of way outside of bound of what I'm uh, arguably qualified to speak on. So, um, but it is, it, I definitely think it's worth being concerned about, um, and it's definitely worth investing and, and paying attention to, to what's, what's coming and what's going on. But I can tell you where we were even five years ago, where we are now, we have a lot more information to be able to make decisions and support good quality decisions that have to protect the public health. Yes, I hate to be the, the person saying from us and leaving. So here's a quick question. It seems to me that when you pull together a thread from what's been discussed so far today, business wants certainty, a lot of uncertainty. You have folks, how are you going to defend against it? I'm wondering if we're still using the right model. Because traditionally what's happening now is corporations are saying, 
we don't want to pay for it, you don't have enough proof to tell me that it's bad. Right now, the government's not saying, we're going to take leadership in figuring it out, so you have even more business uncertainty. Can't we come up with a better model where we look at what's happening in Europe, we look at what the corporations have already done research on this chemical, because we know they have, we pull everybody together and figure out so business can have certainty and human beings aren't worried about whether or not they should be eating charcoal? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Charlie. I, my question is actually going to be really quite related to Sam's. So it is specific. I know it's because no one calls me Sam. <laughs> Sam. Um, I, comparing Europe, I really love John to, to weigh in on this possibly. So Europe, big picture, its environmental regimes not only rests on the precautionary principle, obligation generally on business to prove the safety of something. Here, risk based, right? If you're, we've identified a risk, we don't regulate uh, PFOS, PFOS. To the extent that folks have experience with clients who are working internationally. Do they complain more about the uncertainty in the US or in Europe? So um, most of the companies that manufacture PFOA or have manufactured a lot of them phase it out are also in reach. Um, the, you know who they are if you Google them. And so I think in some ways, if <laughs> they're, they're manufacturing or they're designing for the European market, they're going to design one product, not two different types of a level of product. So in some ways, that is you know, driving the science and driving the, the <coughs> safety is what REACH and other you know, international levels are doing versus what the US is doing. Um, because if their scientists are manufacturing something, they want to come up with the best one that meets all criteria, not the one that meets the lowest necessarily. Um, so I don't think I answered your question, but no, you didn't. okay, Europe is driving it. I think from and that's from a business perspective, not who's going to make me do it. But if I'm manufacturing something and I want to put it in one box and I want to sell it all over the world, you have to meet the highest standard. That's just sort of the way it's working. Yeah, I, I think there are, there are product liability <laughs> things that are happening. I mean, I think of California. Just uh, I think it went late last year added PFOA and PFOS to proxy supply. Yeah. Right. It, even those types of movements can affect a company and in, in build up, right? Yeah. Who's manufacturing a product? So again, it's almost like this, this. There are a lot of drivers, even if they don't necessarily happen where you are, that can still influence the the action or the behavior of a particular company or or even a, a party. So in, in some ways, these you know entities like California, we were talking, you guys were yeah. talking about the cafe, so they can actually help to enact. Um, a market-based opportunity, or at least a reason, <laughs> to um, you know to, to, to operate in a certain fashion, I suppose. So, but that's more that's not a U.S. person. That's within the United States, and I, I, I've definitely seen that um, you know in companies that are even outside of California because they want to sell in both markets. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.